Well, hello and welcome to my channel. Oh, I'm so excited about today because I've been thinking about why do African-American women, Black women, move or travel through Southeast Asia? So I am just overjoyed that I have three <laughs> ladies with me who I've met along my journey of traveling throughout Southeast Asia, but their stories are different than mine. So I figured they could share about their experiences and what got them started. So welcome, Alicia. Welcome, Janice. Welcome to Kira. So I'm just going to start out with a question. And then you ladies just kind of jump in and uh, answer. How about that? Okay. So I know what inspired me, but I want to hear from you ladies. What inspired you to either travel or live in Southeast Asia? I don't think anything inspired me. I think, yeah, I guess something did. My daughter, my son-in-law, and my grandson, who was two at the time, they came to Southeast Asia to work in Bangkok. So I was home and they said, well, if you're not doing nothing special for the next two years, why don't you come visit? So the fact that I had a two-year-old grandson, yes, that was my inspiration. My first grandchild, I wanted to come and I wanted to spend time with him um, wherever they were. It just happened to be in Thailand, Bangkok. So that's how I got here in 2015. So, so if you don't mind then adding Janice, then that in, it inspired you to come, but mm -hmm. what inspired you to stay? Prayer. <laughs> uh, once I was here, uh, my granddaughter was born. She was, she was two. And then I just, um, I liked Bangkok. I liked the diversity of all the cultures of all the different people that I've met. I was not that crazy about the food. I liked the church that I attended. I liked the community of people that I got involved with. I liked the fact that it was economically uh, feasible for me to live here on social security because living back in the States of social security was uh, a bit of a challenge for me. I liked the fact that um, the weather was great. No <laughs> snow, no ice. I didn't have to freeze myself to death. And um, I just met up with a community of people that I just uh, gelled with and mixed with and decided, hey, this is where I want to spend my, my, my years, you know, and just be able to go places. I felt safe here. I could go almost anywhere I wanted to go, do almost anything I wanted to do. Um, so that all of that together kind of inspired me to stay. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. Takira or Alicia? Either um, of you guys want to share your story? Um, I would say for me, the inspiration to travel um, was self-discovery. I think I started my first solo trip was in was to San Francisco um, back in 2020. And I kind of enjoyed having some distance between you know, myself and my family, I guess it kind of, and it's not like I don't love my family, I love my family, but I think it's one of those things because there is that degree of separation, you just feel more comfortable, I guess, stepping into yourself or like allowing yourself to come to the surface and, and trying trying her out. Um, and then pandemic hit, like right after I got that first taste of like freedom, we go into like a lockdown. I'm just like, what is this? And then I'm just like, oh, well, when am I going to be able to get back out? Like, I, I just felt like I was just trapped. Um, and then, you know, I was looking at teaching experiences um, abroad and mostly in Asia. So we're talking China, talking Japan. Um, never really gave much thought to Southeast Asia until, you know, the day to days of, of life kind of started to weigh on me. And I just felt like I just needed time um, to recalibrate, to work on my relationship with Christ um and to really finish the work that I started and in San Francisco without having to be confined to a nine to five so like I didn't want anything to get in the way of that journey um so now we're talking about places you can go where your money 
can go far. Like cost of living is reasonable uh, where you feel safe. Um, and then Southeast Asia kept popping up between Thailand and Vietnam and Malaysia. And I'm just like, I mean, it wasn't the part of Asia I thought, but we're still, we're still going to, to get there. Um, and now I, I kind of, I love it. I think Vietnam feels more so like home um, versus the other place that I've had an opportunity to visit. Um, just some of the nicest people, um, the love that they they give and they share is just so genuine. Um, I find that I am loving it and I've been somewhat craving it. Um, and then it's teaching me to accept it. So I, I'm just learning more about myself. I'm learning more about um, my my flaws, um, my strengths, um, and then working to to heal. And I think that inspired the travel and why I am sticking with the travel. <laughs> Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. You know, that's where you and I met was in Vietnam, Da Nang, Vietnam. And I have to agree in terms of just the, the culture, the climate, the atmosphere of the experience and in, in just flowing there. But I'm not going to go down my path, at least not yet, because I want to hear from Alicia. Yeah. So I actually really love cold weather. <laughs> so I don't, I mean, when I first went to Southeast Asia, I wasn't thrilled about the weather. I had a big ceremony in my Seattle home at the time saying goodbye to all of my winter clothes because I was quite <laughs> sad to be leaving them, but I wanted them to know that I would be back for them someday. <laughs> um, but my journey to Southeast Asia um, was a result, actually, of interest in China. I moved to China and lived there for three years after I graduated from college. And then I came back to the States and got my master's degree in China studies in Seattle um, and got a certificate in museum studies and was thinking about how can I teach people about this part of the world? Um, and I thought museums might be a good place for that as I was finishing up my program. Um, there was a museum opening in Laos, and um, I was like, I don't know anything about this country. It's probably just like China, but smaller and hotter. Um, I will take this job because it seems like a dream job. So I went, and I was shocked to discover it was not just like China, but hotter. And um, <laughs> But I loved it. I loved the two years that I lived there working at that museum. I loved getting to um, connect with people whose backgrounds were so different than mine. And I had never lived somewhere um, that was quite like Lao before in terms of development and um, just infrastructure and um, way of living. It was really relaxed. Um, education wasn't as much of a focus or the educational infrastructure wasn't as robust as some of its neighbors. Um, and I loved my job. And while I lived there, I did get to travel around um, other parts of Southeast Asia. My housemate was from Vietnam, so I got to travel to Vietnam. Um, I took multiple trips to Thailand and I just really fell in love with that part of the world. But it was originally work that took me there. Uh... You, you know, and everything seems so close, so easy, at least in going between um, Thailand and Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia. Everything is relatively close. Um, so that's what's what's helped me is I, I never did a lot of travel except for work. And um, so it's it was nice when I started planning out that I could see that there were countries that I could easily go between in terms of distance. But again, I, I wanna hear some more from you ladies and your perspective on your experiences. So what are one or two, I'm gonna to toss this back over to Janice. What are one or two highlights about living in Southeast Asia or in your case, this is Bangkok, Thailand. Can you think of one or two highlights? One or two some highlights. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of the highlights for me is I feel safe here. I can almost go anywhere by myself. And most of the time I do travel alone when I go places. Um, I can come home. It can be 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night. 
walk down my soy and I know the people, they know me, nobody bothers me. So that's one of the highlights that I enjoy. Um, and it's easy to get from here to other parts of Southeast Asia. You can go to Phuket and Pattaya and Chiang Mai and all those places relatively easy uh, by bus, by train, by plane, by car. So you can travel to other parts um, almost in any, any way you wanna travel. It's not very expensive. Um, and I know uh, you don't necessarily have to speak Thai, but it helps, but you can travel around without speaking Thai. I've been here in almost 10 years and I don't speak a little Thai, but I'm still able to travel and go other places. So I think for me, the highlights would be the fact that I can travel to other places and I feel relatively peace and calm and, and you know, pretty much safe here. But you speak Thai because you said soy. I didn't even know what a soy was. I had to look it up. <laughs> no, I don't speak Thai. It's what everybody calls a street in Thailand is a soy. <laughs> S-O-I. That's a street. It's a soy. <laughs> That's a the extent of my Thai. <laughs> Those little things. Those little things, right. Yeah. So Takira, do you have a highlight or two about your experiences so far in living in Southeast Asia? Yes, I'm going to kind of piggyback on Janice's answer. I think the safety is the one thing that surprised me the most and has become a highlight, that I can be out and about until one, two, three in the morning, which has happened. And no one is paying me any mind. Like as a woman of color, as a woman back at home, like you're always on alert walking home because any anything can happen. And just to like, at any point in the day, I'm walking to or from wherever I'm going and everybody is just minding their business. No one's paying me any mind and I can just be, and I can exist. Um, and it feels good for like my nervous system to be at rest. Like I just feel safe and, and so secure. Um, and that's been everywhere I traveled in Malaysia. I've been out and about and Thailand I've been out and about and I have never felt like, Oh my gosh, like I need to just be like, I'm vigilant. Yes. But like I need to be on alert. Um, and then I think the the second thing for me would be the exposure to different cultures um, and how that exposure has expanded my own capacity. Um, like I think back to the food tour I did last weekend and just learning about like, why are there schools near temples um, and the different approaches to teaching in Thailand. One is where people have more time to like utilize so much ingredients and other the other technique is for, you know, the people who are, who don't have that much time, right? Where work is the bulk of their day and they just have enough time to throw some pork on the grill and call it a day. Um, and it's just the education system, which is funny, everywhere I go, I keep learning more and more about different education systems. Um, and it's just been very interesting to take all that in and just reflect on like, okay, these are the things I'm hearing. These are the things that I like. When I go back home, here's what I would try to implement, should I step back into the education system and things like that. Um, and being able to share those experiences with friends and family, and then they also embrace um, the journey with me. So I think that has, those two have been the, 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 the highlights for me. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah, I know that's one of my favorite things to do is the tours in order to get that history, that background. Um, for, and usually the tour guides are all, you know, like residents of the area or the community that we're touring. So they're always really informative. So Alicia. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was like, what am I going to say? There's so many things. I think for me, my two would be one, my coworkers and the people that I worked with every day uh, were really wonderful and my friendships with them were really um, meaningful. Uh, they would invite me to their house. Um, I remember one time, um, you know, it's kind of like a potluck and everyone brings something. We go to the market and the guy who's responsible for the chicken buys a whole live chicken, puts it in a plastic grocery bag, throws the bag over his motorbike, <laughs> handle puts me on the back and we ride to this guy's house and they take the feathers off the chicken 
fill the chicken, cook the chicken, and that's dinner. And that's not how we do potlucks in the U.S. So uh, just getting to have those kinds of experiences um, was really meaningful and to do it with people who I grew to really love and appreciate is one highlight. And I think another thing was most of my experiences in the States had been in big cities um, or, or medium to large cities. And I was not familiar with what poverty and low levels of development looked like and uh, living in a situation that's, um, that's like that was really eye-opening to me. It was really frustrating in the beginning, not having regular internet, not having regular power. My first day at work, the internet went out halfway through the day and people just took out flashlights and kept working. Um, I didn't have internet at my home, so it was hard to connect with my family. And in the beginning, I felt just really uncomfortable all the time, but I learned how to be, become more comfortable in that environment. And I think the growth that I saw in myself, being able to uh, live in a place like that, that was so different than where I had lived before, uh, but also appreciate that not everyone lives the kind of lives we live in the United States, but they still have meaningful and full lives. It was really valuable for me to seeing um, people's humanity and understanding that my experience wasn't normative across the world. So, yeah. Yes, indeed. You know, it, it is interesting because you do see both sides of, as I'm going to the different countries, what we learned or what I learned was third world. Mm -hmm. I had a particular vision in my mind of the countries I was visiting, but I'd say what really came as a surprise to me is how ultra modern these mm -hmm. countries are. Those images, pictures that I had not seen uh, to the point where I was like, oh my goodness. I, I was saying that just about every day for the first three months. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Their malls are like, four times bigger than any mall that I've been to in the United States and far more lavish. And their uh, transportation system, their, their subways are so elaborate and lavish. But those are the things that really surprised me um, because the images that I had seen on these countries was mainly the impoverished side. But in these cities that are really mega cities and every place that I've been has a mega ultra advanced um, in terms of technology and architecture. So that was just really, really surprising.